The Manhood of Edward Robinson by Agatha Christie With a swing of his mighty arms, Bill lifted her right off her feet, crushing her to his breast. With a deep sigh she yielded her lips in such a kiss as he had never dreamed of. With a sigh, Mr. Edward Robinson put down When Love is King and stared out of the window of the underground train. They were running through Stamford Brook. Edward Robinson was thinking about Bill. Bill was the real hundred percent he-man, beloved of lady novelists. Edward envied him his muscles, his rugged good looks, and his terrific passions. He picked up the book again and read the description of the proud Marchesa Bianca, she who had yielded her lips. So ravishing was her beauty. The intoxication of her was so great that strong men went down before her like ninepins, faint and helpless with love. "'Of course,' said Edward to himself, "'it's all bosh, the sort of stuff. All bosh it is. And yet I wonder.' His eyes looked wistful. Was there such a thing as a world of romance and adventure somewhere? Were there women? Was beauty intoxicated? Was there such a thing as love that devoured one like a flame? This is real life, this is, said Edward. I've got to go on the same just like all the other chaps. On the whole, he supposed, he ought to consider himself a lucky young man. He had an excellent birth, a clerkship in a flourishing concern. He had good health, no one dependent upon him, and he was engaged to Maud. But the mere thought of Maud brought a shadow over his face. Though he would never have admitted it, he was afraid of Maud. He loved her, yes. He still remembered the thrill with which he had admired the back of a white neck rising out of the cheap four and eleven penny blouse on the first occasion they had met. He had sat behind her at the cinema, and the friend he was with had known her and had introduced them. No doubt about it, Maud was very superior. She was good-looking and clever and very ladylike, and she was always right about everything. The kind of girl, everyone said, who would make such an excellent wife. Edward wondered whether the Marchesa Bianca would have made an excellent wife. Somehow he doubted it. He couldn't picture the voluptuous Bianca, with her red lips and her swaying form, tamely sewing on buttons, say, for the virile bill. No, Bianca was romance, and this was real life. He and Maud would be very happy together. She had so much common sense. But all the same, he wished that she wasn't quite so, well, sharp in manner, so prone to jump upon him. It was, of course, her prudence and her common sense which made her do so. Maud was very sensible, and as a rule, Edward was very sensible too, but sometimes... He had wanted to get married this Christmas, for instance. Maud had pointed out how much more prudent it would be to wait a while, a year or two, perhaps. His salary was not large. He had wanted to give her an expensive ring. She had been horror-stricken, and had forced him to take it back and exchange it for a cheaper one. Her qualities were all excellent qualities, but sometimes Edward wished that she had more faults and less virtues. It was the virtues that drove him to desperate deeds. For instance, a blush of guilt overspread his face. He had got to tell her, and tell her soon. His secret guilt was already making him behave strangely. Tomorrow was the first of three days' holiday, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and Boxing Day. She had suggested that he should come around and spend the day with her people, and in a clumsy, foolish manner, a manner that could not fail to arouse her suspicions, he had managed to get out of it. 
had told a long lying story about a pal of his in the country with whom he had promised to spend the day and there was no pal in the country there was only his guilty secret three months ago edward robinson in company with a few hundred thousand other young men had gone in for a competition in one of the weekly papers twelve girls names had to be arranged in order of popularity edward had had a brilliant idea his own preference was sure to be wrong he had noticed that in several similar competitions he wrote down the twelve names arranged in his own order of merit then he wrote them down again this time placing one from the top and one from the bottom of the list alternatively when the result was announced Edward had got eight right out of the twelve, and was awarded the first prize of five hundred pounds. This result, which might easily be ascribed to luck, Edward persisted in regarding as the direct outcome of his system. He was inordinately proud of himself. The next thing was, what to do with the five hundred pounds? He knew very well what Maud would say. Invest it a nice little nest egg for the future and of course maud would be quite right he knew that but to win money as the result of a competition is an entirely different feeling from anything else in the world had the money been left to him as a legacy edward would have invested it religiously in conversion loan or saving certificates as a matter of course but money that one has achieved by a mere stroke of the pen by a lucky and unbelievable chance comes under the same heading as a child's sixpence for your very own to spend as you like and in the certain rich shop which he passed daily on his way to the office was the unbelievable dream a small two-seater car with a long shining nose and a price clearly displayed on it four hundred and sixty-five pounds if I were rich, Edward had said to it, day after day, if I were rich, I'd have you. And now he was, if not rich, at least possessed of a lump sum of money sufficient to realise his dream. That car, that shining, alluring piece of loveliness, was his, if he cared to pay the price. He had meant to tell Maud about the money. Once he had told her, he would have secured himself against temptation. In face of Maud's horror and disapproval, he would never have the courage to persist in his madness. But, as it chanced, it was Maud herself who clinched the matter. He had taken her to the cinema, and to the best seats in the house. She had pointed out to him, kindly but firmly, the criminal folly of his behaviour, wasting good money, three and sixpence against two and fourpence when one saw just as well from the latter places edward took her reproaches in sullen silence maud felt contentedly that she was making an impression edward could not be allowed to continue in these extravagant ways she loved edward but she realized that he was weak Hers the task of being ever at hand to influence him in the way he should go. She observed his worm-like demeanour with satisfaction. Edward was indeed worm-like. Like worms, he turned. He remained crushed by her words, but it was at that precise minute that he made up his mind to buy the car. Damn it, said Edward to himself. For once in my life I'll do what I like. Maud can go hang. And the very next morning he had walked into that palace of plate glass, with its lordly inmates in their glory of gleaming enamel and shimmering metal, and with an insouciance that surprised himself, he bought the car. It was the easiest thing in the world, buying a car. It had been his for four days now. He had gone about, outwardly calm, but inwardly bathed in ecstasy, and to Maud he had as yet breathed no word. For four days, in his luncheon hour, he had received instruction in the handling of this lovely creature. 
He was an apt pupil. Tomorrow, Christmas Eve, he was to take her out into the country. He had lied to Maud, and he would lie again, if need be. He was enslaved body and soul by his new possession. It stood to him for romance, for adventure, for all the things that he had longed for and had never had. Tomorrow, he and his mistress would take the road together. They would rush through the keen old air, leaving the throb and fret of London far behind, out into the wide, clear spaces. At this moment, Edward, though he did not know it, was very near to being a poet. Tomorrow, he looked down at the book in his hand, when love is king. He laughed and stuffed it into his pocket. The car and the red lips of the Marchesa Bianca and the amazing prowess of Bill seemed all mixed up together. Tomorrow, the weather, usually a sorry jade to those who count upon her, was kindly disposed towards Edward. She gave him the day of his dreams, a day of glittering frost and pale blue sky, and a primrose yellow sun. So, in a mood of high adventure, of daredevil wickedness, Edward drove out of London. There was trouble at Hyde Park Corner, and a sad contretemps at Putney Bridge. There was much of protesting of gears, and a frequent jarring of brakes, and much abuse was freely showered upon Edward by the drivers of other vehicles. But for a novice he did not equate himself so badly, and presently he came out onto one of those fair wide roads that are the joy of the motorist. There was little congestion on this particular road today. Edward drove on and on, drunk with his mastery over this creature of the gleaming sides, speeding through the cold white world with the elation of a god. It was a delirious day. He stopped for lunch at an old-fashioned inn, and again later for tea. Then reluctantly he turned homewards, back again to London, to Maud, to the inevitable explanation, recriminations. He shook off the thought with a sigh. Let tomorrow look after itself. He still had today. And what could be more fascinating than this? Rushing through the darkness with the headlights searching out the way in front. Why, this was the best of all. He judged that he had no time to stop anywhere for dinner. This driving through the darkness was a ticklish business. It was going to take longer to get back to London than he had thought. It was just eight o'clock when he passed through Hindhead and came out upon the rim of the Devil's Punch Bowl. There was moonlight, and the snow that had fallen two days ago was still unmelted. He stopped the car and stood staring. What did it matter if he didn't get back to London until midnight? What did it matter if he never got back? He wasn't going to tear himself away from this at once. He got out of the car and approached the edge. There was a path winding down temptingly near him. Edward yielded to the spell. For the next half hour he wandered deliriously in a snowbound world. Never had he imagined anything quite like this. And it was his, his very own given to him by his shining mistress who waited for him faithfully on the road above. He climbed up again, got into the car and drove off, still a little dizzy from the discovery of sheer beauty which comes to the most prosaic men once in a while. Then, with a sigh, he came to himself and thrust his hand into the pocket of the car where he had stuffed an additional muffler earlier in the day. But the muffler was no longer there. The pocket was empty. No, not completely empty. There was something scratchy and hard, like pebbles. Edward thrust his hand deep down. In another minute he was staring like a man bereft of his senses. The object that he held in his hand, dangling from his fingers, with the moonlight striking a hundred fires from it, was a diamond necklace. Edward stared and stared. But there was no doubting possible. 
a diamond necklace worth possibly thousands of pounds, for the stones were large ones, had been casually reposing in the side pocket of the car. But who had put it there? It had certainly not been there when he started from the town. Someone must have come along when he was walking about in the snow, and deliberately thrust it in. But why? Why choose his car? Had the owner of the necklace made a mistake? Or was it... Could it possibly be a stolen necklace? And then, as all these thoughts were whirling through his brain, Edward suddenly stiffened and went cold all over. This was not his car. It was very like it, yes. It was the same brilliant shade of scarlet, red as the Marchesa Bianca's lips. It has the same long and gleaming nose, but by a thousand small signs, Edward realized that it was not his car. Its shining newness was scarred here and there. It bore signs, faint but unmistakable, of wear and tear. In that case... Edward, without more ado, made haste to turn the car. Turning was not his strong point. With the car in reverse, he invariably lost his head and twisted the wheel the wrong way. Also, he frequently became entangled between the accelerator and the foot brake with disastrous results. In the end, however, he succeeded, and straightway the car began purring up the hill again. Edward remembered that there had been another car standing some little distance away. He had not noticed it particularly at the time. He had returned from his walk by a different path from that by which he had gone down into the hollow. The second path had brought him out on the road immediately behind, as he had thought, his own car. It must really have been the other one. In about ten minutes he was once more at the spot where he had halted. But there was now no car at all by the roadside. Whoever had owned this car must now have gone off in Edwards, he also, perhaps, misled by the resemblance. Edward took out the diamond necklace from his pocket and let it run through his fingers perplexedly. What to do next? Run on to the nearest police station? Explain the circumstances? Hand over the necklace? And give the number of his own car? By the way, what was the number of his car? Edward thought and thought but for the life of him he couldn't remember. He felt a cold, sinking sensation. He was going to look the most utter fool at the police station. There was an eight in it. That was all that he could remember. Of course, it didn't really matter. At least... He looked uncomfortably at the diamonds. Supposing they should think... Oh, but they wouldn't. And yet again... They might. That he had stolen the car and the diamonds? Because, after all, when one came to think of it, would anyone in their senses thrust a valuable diamond necklace carelessly into the open pocket of a car? Edward got out and went round to the back of the motor. Its number was XR10061. Beyond the fact that that was certainly not the number of his car, it conveyed nothing to him. Then he set to work systematically to search all the pockets. In the one where he had found the diamonds he made a discovery. A small scrap of paper with some words penciled on it. By the light of the headlights, Edward read them easily enough. Meet me, Graham, corner of Salter's Lane, ten o'clock. He remembered the name Grian. He had seen it on a signpost earlier in the day. In a minute, his mind was made up. He would go to this village, Grian, find Salter's Lane, meet the person who had written the note, and explain the circumstances. That would be much better than looking at a fool in the local police station. He started off almost happily. After all, this was an adventure. This was the sort of thing that didn't happen every day. The diamond necklace made it exciting and mysterious. He had some little difficulty in finding Grian, 
and still more difficulty in finding Salter's Lane. But after knocking up two cottages, he succeeded. Still, it was a few minutes after the appointed hour when he drove cautiously along a narrow road, keeping a sharp lookout on the left-hand side where he had been told Salter's Lane branched off. He came upon it quite suddenly round a bend, and even as he drew up, a figure came forward out of the darkness. At last, a girl's voice cried, What an age you have been, Gerald! As she spoke, the girl stepped right into the glare of the headlights, and Edward caught his breath. She was the most glorious creature he had ever seen. She was quite young, with hair black as night, and wonderful scarlet lips. The heavy cloak that she wore swung open, and Edward saw that she was in full evening dress, a kind of flame-coloured sheath outlining her perfect body. Round her neck was a row of exquisite pearls. Suddenly the girl started. Why? she cried. It isn't Gerald. No, said Edward hastily. I must explain. He took the diamond necklace from his pocket and held it out to her. My name is Edward. He got no further, for the girl clapped her hands and broke in. Edward! Of course! I'm so glad! But that idiot Jimmy told me over the phone that he was sending Gerald along with the car. It's awfully sporting of you to come. I've been dying to meet you. Remember, I haven't seen you since I was six years old. I see you've got the necklace all right. Shove it in your pocket again. The village policeman might come along and see it. Huh! It's cold as ice waiting here. Let me get in. As though in a dream, Edward opened the door, and she sprang lightly in beside him. Her fur swept his cheek, and an elusive scent, like that of violets after rain, assailed his nostrils. He had no plan, no definite thought even. In a minute, without conscious volition, he had yielded himself to the adventure. She had called him Edward. What matter if he were the wrong Edward? She would find him out soon enough. In the meantime, let the game go on. He let in the clutch and they glided off. Presently the girl laughed. Her laugh was just as wonderful as the rest of her. It's easy to see you don't know much about cars. I suppose they don't have them out there. I wonder where out there is, thought Edward. Aloud he said, not much. Better let me drive, said the girl. It's tricky work finding your way round these lanes until we get on the main road again. He relinquished his place to her gladly. Presently they were humming through the night at a pace and with a recklessness that secretly appalled Edward. She turned her head towards him. I like pace. Do you? You know, you're not a bit like Gerald. No one would ever take you to be brothers. You're not a bit like what I imagined, either. I suppose, said Edward, that I'm so completely ordinary. Is that it? Not ordinary. Different. I can't make you out. How's poor old Jimmy? Very fed up, I suppose. Oh, Jimmy's all right, said Edward. It's easy enough to say that, but it's rough luck on him having a sprained ankle. Did he tell you the whole story? Not a word. I'm completely in the dark. I wish you would enlighten me. Oh, the thing worked like a dream. Jimmy went in at the front door, talked up in his girl's clothes. I gave him a minute or two, and then shinned up to the window. Agnes Lorella's maid was there laying out Agnes's dress and jewels, and all the rest. Then there was a great yell downstairs, and the squib went off, and everyone shouted fire. The maid dashed out, and I hopped in, helped myself to the necklace, 
and was out and down in a flash, and out of the place by the back way across the punch bowl. I shoved the necklace and the notice where to pick me up in the pocket of the car in passing. Then I joined Louis at the hotel, having shed my snow boots, of course. Perfect alibi for me. She had no idea I'd been out at all. And what about Jimmy? Well, you know more about that than I do. He didn't tell me anything, said Edward easily. Well, in the general rag, he caught his foot in his skirt and managed to sprain it. They had to carry him to the car, and the Lorella chauffeur drove him home. Just fancy if the chauffeur had happened to put his hand in the pocket. Edward laughed with her, but his mind was busy. He understood the position more or less now. The name of Lorella was vaguely familiar to him. It was a name that spelt wealth. This girl, and an unknown man called Jimmy, had conspired together to steal the necklace, and had succeeded. Owing to his sprained ankle and the presence of the Lorella chauffeur, Jimmy had not been able to look in the pocket of the car before telephoning to the girl. Probably had had no wish to do so. But it was almost certain that the other unknown Gerald would do so at any early opportunity, and in it he would find Edward's muffler. "'Good going,' said the girl. A tram flashed past them. They were on the outskirts of London. They flashed in and out of the traffic. Edward's heart stood in his mouth. She was a wonderful driver, this girl, but she took risks. Quarter of an hour later they drew up before an imposing house in a frigid square. "'We can shed some of our clothing here,' said the girl, "'before we go on to Ritson's.' "'Ritson's?' queried Edward. He mentioned the famous light club almost reverently. "'Yes. Didn't Gerald tell you?' "'He did not,' said Edward grimly. "'What about my clothes?' She frowned. Didn't they tell you anything? We'll rig you up somehow. We've got to carry this through. A stately butler opened the door and stood aside to let them enter. Mr. Gerald Shantings rang up, your ladyship. He was very anxious to speak to you, but he wouldn't leave a message. I bet he was anxious to speak to her, said Edward to himself. At any rate... I know my full name now. Edward Champneys. But who is she? Your ladyship, they called her. What did she want to steal a necklace for? Rich debts? In the few lettons which she occasionally read, the beautiful and titled heroine was always driven desperate by bridge debts. Edward was led away by the stately butler, and delivered over to a smooth-mannered valley. A quarter of an hour later he rejoined his hostess in the hall, exquisitely attired in the evening clothes made in Seville Row which fitted him to a nicety. Heavens! What a night! They drove in the car to the famous Ritsons. In common with everyone else, Edward had read scandalous paragraphs concerning Ritsons. Anyone who was anyone turned up at Ritson sooner or later. Edward's only fear was that someone who knew the real Edward Champneys might turn up. He consoled himself by the reflection that the real man had evidently been out of England for some years. Sitting at a little table against the wall, they sipped cocktails. Cocktails! To the simple Edward they represented the quintessence of the fast life. The girl, wrapped in a wonderful embroidered shawl, sipped nonchalantly. Suddenly she dropped the shawl from her shoulders and rose. Let's dance. Now the one thing that Edward could do to perfection was to dance. When he and Maud took the floor together at the Palais de Danse, Lesser Light stood still and watched in admiration. "'I nearly forgot,' said the girl suddenly. "'The necklace?' She held out her hand. Edward, 
completely bewildered, drew it from his pocket and gave it to her. To his utter amazement, she coolly clasped it round her neck. Then she smiled up at him intoxicatingly. Now, she said softly, we'll dance. They danced, and in all Ritson's nothing more perfect could be seen. Then, as at length they returned to their table, an old gentleman with a would-be rakish air accosted Edward's companion. Ah, Lady Noreen, always dancing. Yes, yes. Is Captain Folliot here tonight? Jimmy has taken a toss, racked his ankle. You don't say so. How did that happen? No details as yet. She laughed and passed on. Edward followed, his brain in a whirl. He knew now. Lady Noreen Elliot, the famous Lady Noreen herself, perhaps the most talked-of girl in England, celebrated for her beauty, for her daring, the leader of that set known as the Bright Young People. Her engagement to Captain James Folliot, V.C., of the Household Cavalry, had been recently announced. But the necklace? He still couldn't understand the necklace. He must risk giving himself away, but no, he must. As they sat down again, he pointed to it. Why that, Noreen? he said. Tell me why. She smiled dreamily, her eyes far away, the spell of the dawn still holding her. It's difficult for you to understand, I suppose. One gets so tired of the same thing, always the same thing. Treasure hunts were all very well for a while, but one gets used to everything. Burglaries were my idea. Fifty pounds entrance fee, and lots to be drawn. This is the third. Jimmy and I drew Agnes Lorella. You know the rules? Burglary to be carried out within three days, and a loot to be worn for at least an hour in a public place, or you forfeit your stake and a hundred pound fine. It's rough luck on Jimmy spraining his ankle, but we'll scoop the pool all right. I see, said Edward, drawing a deep breath. I see. Noreen rose suddenly, pulling her shawl round her. Drive me somewhere in the car, down to the docks, somewhere horrible and exciting. Wait a minute. She reached up and unclasped the diamonds from her neck. You would better take these again. I don't want to be murdered for them. They went out of Ritson's together. The car stood in a small by-street, narrow and dark. As they turned the corner towards it, Another car drew up to the curb, and a young man sprang out. "'Thank the Lord, Noreen. I've got hold of you at last,' he cried. "'There's the devil to pay. That ass Jimmy got off with the wrong car. God knows where those diamonds are at this minute. We are in the devil of a mess.' Lady Noreen stared at him. "'What do you mean? We've got the diamonds.' At least Edward has. Edward? Yes. She made a slight gesture to indicate the figure by her side. It's I who am in the devil of a mess, thought Edward. Ten to one, this is Brother Gerald. The young man stared at him. What do you mean? He said slowly. Edward is in Scotland. Oh! cried the girl. She stared at Edward. Oh! Her colour came and went. So you, she said in a low voice, are the real thing? It took Edward just one minute to grasp the situation. There was awe in the girl's eyes. Was it? Could it be? Admiration? Should he explain? Nothing so tame. He would play up to the end. He bowed ceremoniously. I have to thank you, Lady Noreen, he said, in the best highwayman manner. 
for a most delightful evening. One quick look he cast at the car from which the other had just alighted. A scarlet car with a shining bonnet. His car. And I will wish you a good evening. One quick spring and he was inside, his foot on the clutch. The car started forward. Gerald stood paralyzed, but the girl was quicker. As the car slid past, she leapt for it, alighting on the running board. The car swerved, shot blindly round the corner, and pulled up. Noreen, still panting from her spring, laid her hand on Edward's arm. "'You must give it me. Oh, you must give it me. I've got to return it to Agnes Lorella. Be a sport. We've had a good evening together. We have danced. We have been... pals. Won't you give it to me? To me?' A woman who intoxicated you with her beauty. There were such women then. Also, Edward was only too anxious to get rid of the necklace. It was a heaven-sent opportunity for a beau guest. He took it from his pocket and dropped it into her outstretched hand. We have been... pals, he said. Huh. Her eyes smouldered, lit up. Then surprisingly she bent her head to him. For a moment he held her, her lips against his. Then she jumped off. The scarlet car sped forward with a great leap. Romance! Adventure! At twelve o'clock on Christmas Day, Edward Robinson strode into the tiny drawing-room of a house in Clapham with the customary greeting of Merry Christmas. Maud, who was rearranging a piece of holly, greeted him coldly. "'Have a good day in the country with that friend of yours?' she inquired. "'Look here,' said Edward. "'That was a lie I told you. I won a competition, five hundred pounds, and I bought a car with it. I didn't tell you because I knew you would kick up a row about it. That's the first thing. I've bought the car and there's nothing more to be said about it. The second thing is this. I'm not going to hang about for years. My prospects are quite good enough, and I mean to marry you next month. See? Oh, said Maud faintly. Was this... could this be... Edward speaking in this masterful fashion? Will you? said Edward. Yes or no? She gazed at him, fascinated. There was awe and admiration in her eyes, and the sight of that look was intoxicating to Edward. Gone was the patient motherliness which had roused him to exasperation. So had the Lady Noreen looked at him last night. But the Lady Noreen had receded far away, right into the region of romance, side by side with the Marchesa Bianca. This was the real thing. This was his woman. Yes or no, he repeated, and drew a step nearer. Ye-yes, faltered Maud. But, oh, Edward, what has happened to you? You're quite different today. Yes, said Edward. For twenty-four hours I've been a man instead of a worm. And by God! It pays. He caught her in his arms almost as Bill the Superman might have done. Do you love me, Maud? Tell me, do you love me? Oh, Edward, breathed Maud, I adore you. The End